Okay, this is, as Rudy said, the concept clearance for the reissuance of the Centers of Excellence in LC Research or SEER uh, program request for applications. Um, SEER program was established in 2003. There are three primary goals. The first is to create transdisciplinary research teams that can integrate behavioral, social sciences, legal and humanities research, and genomic research efforts. Second goal is to facilitate the translation of research findings so that they can be used to inform health research and public policies and practices. And the third goal is to train the next generation of LC researchers with a special emphasis on recruiting and retaining underrepresented and underserved minorities. Um, traditionally, we've used the P50 or SEER full center grant mechanism and a P20 or a planning grant mechanism. So this is just a very, uh, hopefully, quick history of the funding of the program. We've um, issued the RFA four times. This would be the fifth issuance. Um, we issued it in 2000. Three, let's see, 2003, 2006, 2009, and 2012 for funding in 2004, 7, um, 10, and 13. So in 2004, we funded the first set of SEER grants, and these, the full centers are in yellow. Um, when they're renewed, it's in dark orange. When we bridge funded, it, it's in light orange, and the planning grants are in green. So in 2004, we funded the first full centers at Case Western, Duke, Stanford, and the University of Washington. We funded three planning grants at University of North Carolina, Harvard, and Howard. In 2007, we funded two P50s. One was a conversion, a successful conversion of the planning grant at UNC into a full center grant. And the other was a new center grant at the University of Pennsylvania. We did not at that year issue a request of applications for the planning grants. In 2010, the first uh, class of centers uh, renewed for their second uh, four or five years. So that was Case Western, Duke, Stanford, and UW. And then we also funded two new planning grants at Columbia and Oregon Health Sciences uh, University. In 2013, the UNC um, Center grant was renewed, and uh, the Columbia grant made a successful trans, uh, transition to a full P50. And we funded three new centers at Hopkins, Kaiser UCF, and University of Utah. One reason I put this up was to make the point that the planning grants don't always make a successful transition to a full center grant. So you can, you can see it's about 40% of the time. Um, also, just to give you a sense, uh, council recommended that we keep the SEER program to less than a third of the LC set-aside budget. So in 2014, we funded five full centers and three planning grants for $5.8 million, which was about 32% of the LC set-aside. Um, so we feel this has been a successful program. Um, they've established productive transdisciplinary research teams that have been involved in the integration of a broad spectrum of LC and genomic research. A number of our SEER investigators are serving as principal investigators, uh, investigators or consultants on a lot of the big uh, genomic medicine projects, Emerge, CSER, and more recently the newborn sequencing grants. They provided um, resources for policymakers. The teams have written policy briefs and white papers that have been used to inform both state and federal legislation. And they've provided expert testimony to Congress, uh, the state legislatures, President's Bioethics Commission, and a number of advisory commissions, uh, federal advisory commissions. And they've also served as chairs and members of those commissions. Um, in the training department, um, They've about 100 uh, graduate and postdoctoral students and junior faculty members have gone through center training and mentoring um, programs. Approximately 25% of these trainees have been members of minority or underserved populations. Um, I'd also mention that our centers have done some 
outreach and training efforts at the undergraduate level as well. And they've found that that's been a very successful way of recruiting and retaining minority students to bring them into the pipeline. Um, many of the graduate uh, students and postdocs have tr transitioned to tenure track positions and a number are now PIs on their own NIH research grants. Um, also, I'd just say through the work they've done across academic uh, disciplines at their institutions, they've generated a fair amount of support for this kind of broad spectrum interdisciplinary work. Okay, each time we've issued the RFA, we make changes. Um, and they're usually, uh, well, they're always to um, address the fact that genomic research is moving so quickly and also the LC program itself is growing and evolving. So this uh, chart really um, lays out the changes we're proposing for the 2015 RFA over the last RFA, which was issued in 2012. So in two 2012, we had strongly encouraged applicants to develop a single project as the main focus um, for their research. And this was to ensure that the research um, that they were describing was proposed in enough detail that it, the peer reviewers could really assess its scientific merit. Concerns had been raised that there wasn't enough detail to really review what was happening at the centers. And so we made this shift to try to um, put more meat on the bones, as it were. Um, this was a noble effort, but after we did it, we got a lot of feedback from the centers and from others in the community, feeling that this really narrowed the focus too much, and it inhibited their ability to be more agile and to respond to emerging issues. So for the new RFA, we're giving a little bit more flexibility in the research design. They can propose a single project if they'd like, or a series of more tightly interwoven projects that are built around a, um, a well-defined theme um, that is not too broadly focused. So we're trying to hit the sweet spot here and get enough meat on the bones, but not limit them too much. Uh, the second change we're making, and this is really to um, address how rapidly genomic medicine is moving. And we're, what we're suggesting is rather than having the Sears go for five years with a five-year renewal, we're proposing a four-year original grant with a four-year renewal. This will enable the Sears to turn over more rapidly and hopefully we'll be able to fund additional Sears. Um, in that same vein, we are uh, proposing to limit the direct costs. Did my mic fall off? Is it working now? Sorry about that. You didn't miss anything important. Um, so uh, in 2015, we're proposing to limit the direct cost to 650000 a year instead of 750000 And again, this is to allow for more rapid turnover in the SEERS and hopefully to fund additional SEERS. In the training department, traditionally, we've focused on postdoctoral training. But as I mentioned, the SEERS have found that training across the full pipeline is actually a very effective way, particularly to bring in um, underserved and minority populations. And as Eric mentioned, we've also just recently issued a T32 institutional training program for LC training for pre-docs and post-docs. So the ho hope is that this center training will complement the more structured, traditional uh, T32 training. The final change is really just mechanical. We have, um, we're going with the RM1 mechanism rather than the P50 because it allows for a better integrated um, uh, application. We are not going to issue a planning grant solicitation at this point, and it's really just being done so that we can synchronize the grants, the existing and new SEERS, um, though we will consider issuing a planning RFA in the future. Uh, briefly, uh, this, app, this uh, request for applications is open to all applicants. We do expect the planning grantees will uh, submit applications, but we're also expecting to get applications from another, a number of other institutes. That's been our, our um, experience in the past, and we fully expect that this time. We're hoping to set aside $3 million to fund up to three SEERS. 
We have been talking to a number of other ICs that are, are interested in participating and if they can get permission to participate and can um, actually set aside funds, we're hoping to be able to fund additional centers. Um, and finally, this is just the, oops, the timeline. We're looking at a March 2015 release. Um, applications should be received this summer, probably reviewed during the fall. They'll come back to council in February 2016 for a spring 2016 start date. And I think, Amy, are you on the phone? Yes, I'm here, sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, I was going to give Amy the first crack at this since the person on the phone often gets left off. <laughs> Thanks, Joy. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I think this looks great. I'm, I'm very supportive of this year program continuing, and I think that um, there were several changes made to the RFA in response to the last cycle that are um, in the positive direction. Um, you know, I think this move away from focusing on one large research project is a really positive move, and it allows for sort of um, centers to develop around uh, doing smaller projects around a given topic, which I think is probably better for a center-oriented um, grant than having a large sort of R01 type grant being funded. Um, so I think that provides some more flexibility and is good. Um, and, you know, the, the way the RFA is written right now around that leaves it a little bit open. And so, I mean, I would even encourage more structure around that in terms of saying you want people to focus on a particular topic area, but that they should be doing um, multiple sort of smaller projects in that topic area. Um, I think the four years of funding, the reduced funding, um, the reduced time for the renewal and the reduced budget is probably okay because um, what I see as being necessary for the more long-term um, uh, infrastructure for the SEERS is really the training programs that get set up and, and run. And now with the new um, 232 program, that might help sort of those centers that are doing extensive training programs to be able to sustain that training, those training programs and that infrastructure for longer periods of time. Um, I do think uh, there, there uh, may be some questions about eligibility and, and um, one of the things that, that came up that we've discussed is whether we have the original five years now that are going to be expiring after their, their, their five-year renewal period and whether those institutions are eligible to go back in and whether individuals who are involved in those programs, um, either as PI or as co-investigators, are eligible to, to apply for new SEER. So I think some clarity around that might be really helpful um, for those groups. Um, and then I guess the last, the last thing that I just wanted to bring up for conversation is, um, you know, one of the things that I've thought a lot about is how do the P20s and the P50s sort of work together. So, um, you know, I think obviously the, um, I don't know what the expectations are or what the instructions are to the review panel about P20s that are going up for P50s. You mentioned, Joy, that not all of the P20s are successfully um, transitioned into P50s. Um, and on the one hand, I think if you've invested sort of the money and the resources into, into a planning grant, you would hope that they would be successful in developing a full center and continue to get funding as a full center. Um, on the other hand, I hear that there's a real desire to have other groups sort of apply straight out for a P50 without previously having a planning grant. And so I think there's a little bit of a, of a tension there. You want the planning grants to be successful, but you want other people to come in and be competitive. And I guess it's never been really clear to me what the value of the P20 is, is during that time. Are they doing sort of independent work that if they just finish after those whatever, how many years, three years or so, that they have the P20 it's been a good use of money, or if they don't really transition into a P50, then it's really not a good use of money, and it's having a P20 really um, get people in a position to be more successful once they get a P50. And I, and I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's probably worth a discussion um, to see sort of how those play out with each other because it's kind of an odd um, transition or non-transition, period. So those were kind of my preliminary thoughts and comments on this. But overall, I think it's a great program. I'm glad that, that we're continuing to support it. And I think some of the changes that were made are really positive. OK. Um, I think what I'll do is just go to Chinita and Artie, and then we can start addressing some of the questions you raised. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I, I agree. I'm also very enthusiastic about this concept. And I'm glad to see that there's continued support for uh, this program within 
um, within the LC um, program. I do uh, think that changing the focus and scope of the of the work that's proposed to a broader set of themes rather than a specific research project is is a good way to go. As I remember the work that we did at Penn, ours was within the framework. It was a, a broader concept, and I think that worked really well, um, at least at our center. I, um, you know, I share many of the reactions that Amy said, so I won't repeat all those, but I will say that um, Particular to the, the training, I think this has been one program that has been very successful. And I just wonder, um, I think it's important to sort of document and discuss what the metrics for success would be in terms of measuring training um, within this program and to make sure that it's consistent with the metrics that are established in the um, education and training branch. And then I, I do want to say, I mean, I, I've seen the, the dollar amount that's budgeted the three million is that per center or total or that's total it would be about a million a center so I just wonder you know given I know budget is a the is an issue um, but I just wonder about you know for, for you know how that compares of what we're investing in terms of this particular funding mechanism rather to rather to other things outside of the LC program I know Elsie has a specific set aside of money, and, I'm, and I, I get that, I understand that, and that you know we have to work within those means. But I think it'd be useful to have some conversation about how to support this from other components of NHGRI. It seems like three million for these centers just seems really low relative to the millions that are invested in the sequencing centers and other initiatives. So I think that's something we should talk about as a, as a group. I'm going to go to Artie first and then. Sure. So I was have been a beneficiary of the SEER funding since 2004, so for the last 10 years. So with that uh, potential conflict of interest on the table, I will uh, comment that I think it's been uh, extremely uh, useful for purposes of setting up an infrastructure of researchers who work in this area. I happen to be at a law school, and I've um, had three well, two and a half, I suppose, uh, uh, students who've gone on to tenure track uh, law positions as a consequence of the SEER funding. So I think it's been very useful in that regard. I also concur with Amy and uh, Chinita in saying that I think that the our uh, center has always been very broadly defined in, in uh, the general intellectual property space. And so the consequence of that has been extremely um, uh, broad interest from across the university, uh, from the law school, which is my school, um, the business school, the public policy school, the basic science groups. Um, we've had just a, I mean, part of it has to do with our um, SEER director, Bob Cook Deegan, who's just an extraordinary network builder. But in addition, um, the consequence of, of having a, a broad uh, umbrella has been um, extreme in interdisciplinarity, which I think going forward, I would suggest it would be a real virtue of the SEER process. Um, and to, uh, you know, sound a theme that I think I'm a little bit of a broken record on, I think it would be real, uh, at least our center was able to draw upon the expertise not only of, uh, of scholars in the humanities, but also in the more quantitative social sciences, so political science and economics were well represented in our center, and I don't see political scientists and economists necessarily well represented across the board in the LC group. I think that would be an extremely useful set of people to have going forward, particularly because, as we might imagine, um, much as we're all excited about personalized and precision medicine, it also has the potential to be quite costly, and an economist's perspective on that set of issues would be extremely useful. Great. We agree completely. And Dan, did you have a question or comment? Well, I just wanted to make a comment about the, the investment in, in, in LC issues. So, I mean, there's a big investment in, in CSER. There's a big investment in Emerge that's a, uh, that, that focuses on those issues as well. So it's, it's not like this is the only LC initiative that we're working on. I understand that. I understand that clearly. But I think that when you look at the dollar amount that's specific for this program, which is, I think, 
we would all agree is probably one of the flagship programs of, of this, of, of, of LC to, I mean, that seems low to me. Well, we will hope to keep it around 33%. So the $3 million is just the new grants we're funding. So hopefully it won't stay that low. Um, going back to the eligibility of existing centers, um, this has been a question that we've talked about and we would love to get council input. Our feeling was that once a, an institution had a center grant, they really shouldn't be coming back in for a second, ins or, or a second center grant, even if it is a different set of, of investigators. Simply because we really want to spread the wealth, we'd like to see these take hold at institutions across the country rather than being concentrated in a single institution. And I don't know if, if council has an opinion about that or whether that, that seems like a reasonable approach. I don't know that much about LC research, but in other contexts, it's, it's extremely difficult to build a program, build a training program, and then dismantle it in four years. It seems like, and I, but I understand the desires to, to spread the wealth, and I was wondering if a compromise would be two cycles. They, they do get two cycles. I'm okay. sorry if I didn't make that clear, for a total of eight years. Okay. So I, I know it might sound, I mean, I think that's actually very generous that they've had two cycles to be competitive. And I, I would like, I, I'm in, in favor of limiting the participation or not allowing those who've had two cycles of funding to, to come to apply. Because I think that, in my mind, at, that, at this point, they should be ready to, either the institution should be investing in it or there should be other sources of funding that are sustaining it, so I agree with that. Okay. So I hear an institutional restriction. Uh, is that what you're talking about? I guess um, it sounds harsh to well, put no, it that but way, but I mean, I, I think that I, I guess what I would like to have happen is that people would say, "Okay, we've had this for two two rounds of funding." I know that won't happen, perhaps, but um, then I say you cannot apply. I would like for them to recognize that they shouldn't apply. And that they Right. Yeah, I just yeah. am mindful of the fact that that Joy's phone is going to start ringing as soon as we vote. <laughs> and people are going to ask if they can collaborate on someone else's center. I think if they can co collaborate but not going in as a lead institution, I think, is the appropriate. Okay. That's, that's a helpful clarification. Thanks, Judy. Yeah, Bob. Joy, Joy, I wonder, do you know in, in some of the groups that their funding has ended, that indeed the program has continued even after the funding has ended? and how it's being supported, or did it not continue? They're actually, the first class are just now ending. 2014 was the end of their funding cycle. Um, and so I think the indications are that at some institutions, they'll probably continue. And um, we're hoping that some of those institutions will actually come in for the T32 training grant to kind of provide some continuing support but I think it, that's not going to happen at every institution. It's just like the P20 grants, the planning grants. Sometimes it takes and sometimes it doesn't. It has a lot to do with the um, principal investigator, if they're staying engaged or if they're, you know, moving on to other things. I think that's an issue. So my, my question was very similar to, to Bob's in that. Um, is, is part of the criteria for applying for one of these things a, a plan for sustainability beyond the, the time frame for which they're qualified for funding. Right, and in fact, that's required for the renewal applications, that they have that to was my other have a plan for how they work, will continue um, institutional support. Okay. Yes. So I have a question related to, so after they've been established for eight years, um, where do they get their funding then in general in the NIH? So where are those other sources um, for these investigators. Right. As I mentioned, a lot of them are actually involved in these large NHGRI genomic medicine projects. So some of their funding is coming from that source. Some of them come in for LC grants for R01s, R21s, other grants. And some are funded by other institutions at NIH. Um, they also get funding from other sources, the Greenwall Foundation, um, sometimes NSF even. So, so I guess that comes back to Chinita's question around are there, 
if I'm interpreting correctly what you said, is are there enough resources to support the investigators afterwards? Is that it was that your comment about the relative ratio between the different between the different programs? No, my comment was just about the dollar amount. It wasn't about if there are enough resources outside of it. It was just about the dollar amount that's available within the program to support this initiative. Joy, this is Amy. Um, given the sort of uh, line of questioning, do you, I, I wonder, because you haven't really had experience with centers ending up until now, um, and the first five are kind of ending after their, their renewal cycle now, and I wonder if it would be possible to kind of um, gather some data on, you know, what, where are they getting supported from, how much funding, what's the level of funding, or is the infrastructure staying in place, or is it just disbanding, or what's happening with those centers, because that might be right. useful information. That's a great idea. We will, we will make that so. Other questions? And just to state the counterpoint, you, you, you know, you spend eight years building these wonderful programs that kind of, I guess there's also kind of a shame in, in letting them, if they're unable to kind of find other means of support easily, letting them kind of dismantle when, when they might, you know, these might be the best places for these programs over longer periods. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how to balance it, um, but, but our hope is obviously that they continue to get support through other sources. Did I answer all your questions, Amy? Yeah, I think you did. I mean, I think, you know, the, the only point, it's really not a question, was just um, thinking a little carefully about the, the transition or not from P20s to P50s. And, and I mean, I don't, I don't think there's a question to answer there. I think it's a difficult balance because, you know, I guess the question is, what is the utility of the P20s? Is it worth it to continue to have a P20 program? Is it a good, is it a good um, use of funding or should that money be invested more in the P50 centers? And if it is a good use of funding, um, you know, that balance between wanting to, and, you know, hoping that those P20s are successful into turning into P50s, but on the other hand, um, encouraging people, you know, there's, there's giving three P50s, there's been three P20s, and sort of making it clear to the community whether, um, you know, who should be applying for those P50s. And I, I think it's a hard, it's a hard balance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think our experience is that the P20s that did successfully convert, this would be at Columbia and UNC, the centers really had a head start. It was a real advantage to have had a P20. And I, I would say that the investment has paid off, even though you know only 40% of them make it. And that the P20s are relatively inexpensive investment. And I'd second what you'd said, having been at UNC, it was a huge leg up in being able to then do a successful application. Right. So my recollection from 10 years ago, because I was involved in the initial review, was that the idea behind the P20, there wasn't enough money to do a lot of research to generate a lot of preliminary data. The idea was to allow people to come together and start talking because they didn't have those natural interactions and they were supposed to be very, very multidisciplinary. I don't know if that's still the case 10 years on, but that was the purpose then. Absolutely. Um, any other questions? Do we need to take a vote? Yep, we sure do. So can I get a motion to approve the concept? And a second. All in favor? Any opposed? I'm sorry, you opposed? Okay. And uh, the people on the phone, uh, David, are you still with us? All right, Val, are you with us? If you're on mute, then send me your vote by email. This is Amy. Oh, I Amy. Approve. Okay, you approve. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Joy. All right, next up, uh, Adam. Uh, he's going to go through four concepts. Now, we're not going to incarcerate you through all of that, so I'll alert you to the fact that we will take a break somewhere close to 3 o'clock. It all depends on the, on the timing of how quickly Adam moves through them. So, Adam, you're going to give a bit of an overview, but you're going to go through the concepts one at a time, and we'll stop for a vote, correct? Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is a series of four uh, concepts on the genome sequencing program. 